welcome to Motor Mouth, brought to you by the Boyertown Museum of Historic Vehicles. I'm Kendra Cook. This is Dan Olson. Yep. Hi. And Happy New Year. It's 2019 now. We are in the beautiful Reading Diner that is part of the museum gallery. And <clears throat> if you'd like to visit the museum, we'd love to see you. We are open seven days a week, 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can give us a call, 610 367 2090. You can visit our website, www.boyertownmuseum.org, or look for us on Facebook. Uh, we update there pretty regularly. And uh, if you visit our Facebook or website pages, you might see our upcoming events. And uh, one thing I want to remind you all about is in February, February 23rd and 24th, <coughs> that's a Saturday and a Sunday. And that is going to be one of our Hoods Up weekends. So basically what that means is, now if you look in here on a normal day, and you'll see probably in the background a little bit as we go out there and talk, um, the hoods on our cars and trucks are closed. Um, but on Hoods Up weekend, we prop them up. And you can check out all the mm -hmm. engines if you're really into the mechanicals of these cars. This is a great time to come out. Um, it's the same admission price as always. Uh, it's included with the regular admission. But if you're really into the engines and how these cars work, that's a great time to come. We'll have extra tour guides on hand. and I'll probably be here one of those days. Yeah, I'll probably drag myself in too, right? Be. Oh. <laughs> well, if you're here, that will make it worthwhile. Everybody should There you come. go. <laughs> and then you can try to stump us with what some of these strange things that these early automakers were doing on these cars. And that's what's so neat about Hoods Up Weekend too, is that we do have so many early and one-off things or last remaining. There's some really unique stuff under the hoods mm -hmm. that you can check out. So that's our biggest thing coming up. Um, other than that, here, oh, di next diner day. Well, I didn't mean that, that isn't, don't we have like a Fosnock day? <clears throat> oh yeah, we do. We do have another, a Fosnock day. Another eating, eating yes, event. Yes, another excuse to eat in the diner, which we always look for those. Um, Fosnock Day or uh, Fat Tuesday, um, that is March 5th this year. So Easter is a little late this year. Um, hmm. Usually we do our hoods up in March and the Fosnock thing in February. We flip-flopped them now this year because of that. So Fosnock Day is kind of like Diner Day if you've been to that, except instead of pie, we've got Fosnocks. Same price um, prices as the Diner Day and uh, if that one is from 11 to 2, we have move it back an hour in case maybe those of you that work, because it is a Tuesday, um, maybe you can swing by during your lunch break or something. So we'll have nice Can't make it. fatty Fosnocks. I don't eat Fosnocks myself, so you want me to save you mine? I hear they're good for like a scratchy throat. <laughs> yeah, I can't get rid of mine. So. Yeah, that's, you need one of them. <laughs> so uh, we'll be here on March 5th. And then Diner Day is in April, so, you know, after, after January, we're going to start coming up with these great events for you all to come mm -hmm. out and visit us again. So, <clears throat> Dan. What? How's your New Year treating you? So far, pretty cool. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, uh, whatever you're talking about tonight, do we need to move out there? In the, yes, the we do. Yep. All right, yep. well, give us a moment. We'll see you out in the gallery. You know, I was reminded before the camera started that we did talk about this car, or more specifically this company, it was a while ago. Okay. A while ago. But I don't think you're talking specifically about... We talked about this? Well, like electrics and the... Okay. Oh, what's his name? The guy who invented the Jeep, Carl... Yep. Yeah, Carl. He worked for them. The guy, Carl. Yeah, Carl. Yeah, Carl. Before he went to Bantam. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, we're not going to be really talking about this make a car. No. We're not going to be talking about Carl or... A specific yeah. feature. Of yeah, sort of, kind of, sort of. Okay, I'll okay. let you go. Okay, we are going to be talking about a guy called William A. Utz. U-T-T-Z. Not like the pretzels. No, that's only okay. one T. I got two, excited there for a T's, minute. Okay. okay, William A. Utz, and he was an inventor of such things such as airplane parachute, tape dispensers, turn signals, 
And the parachute, the airplane parachute, it's not a passenger using a parachute. It was a parachute for the whole plane. So if you were going down, the, the pilot would push a button, and this thing popped out the back and slow you down. How big did that have to be? I don't know. I, don't oh know. I didn't really get into that, and we're not going to talk about okay. this. Anyway, um, some of the things he, he um, did, he, he had all sorts of um, inventions. Goofy I ideas, maybe. Uh, I don't know. You know he sounds again, like a James Hill sort of. Dabbling in this. Yeah, he could have been. He could have been. Okay. But we're talking about <clears throat> three of his inventions. Okay. Okay. And two of them are very similar. And the third one is like, that's the coup de grace at the end. Okay. Or however it is. All right. Okay. Anyway. All right, Mr. Utz. So we're going to talk about windshields, windows, and cars. Okay. In the 19th century. Okay. Uh, what cars that were out there weren't really slow but for their time I guess it was speeding along yeah. and people wore goggles and you see sure. pictures of, of them back then they wore you know the goggles over the eyes that's the protection okay um, 1903 safety glass was developed by uh, somebody in France I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name um, that's 1903 patented a few years later car makers were not interested in it because it cost money there you okay. go. Okay. And um, so they said, nah, we don't want it. Yeah. And it's also interesting, um, I'm going to say that back in this era, there was something I read about that if a car was going, they said you couldn't drive more than 10 miles an hour because it was bad for your insides, It'd make your lungs collapse. Oh 10 miles an hour. Wow. Okay. Be careful. I can think quicker than yeah. I. Barely. Sometimes okay. I can. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> uh, early 20th century um, windshields were considered dangerous because it was just regular glass and it would shatter yeah. and yeah, you could see danger. And, oh yeah. You know, and um, so it was just regular window glass. And in 1914, I came across mm -hmm. these statistics: 53 of all automobile injuries were caused by broken glass. 35 of them left indelible scars, 15% caused serious mutilation, 2% were fatal. Wow. That was from a magazine back then, okay. A uh, series of lawsuits led up to the development of stronger windshields. Um, most notable example was a um, two people, well, I guess one person, Payne versus, Moore, versus Ford. They had a case in 1917 about it. Uh, after that, um, Ford started having laminated glass in, in all his vehicles. Um, that laminated glass, remember I said 1903, that's sort of, they came up with some sort of plastic coating on top of glass. Well, the laminated glass was plastic in between two sheets uh, and it was okay. safety. And it was pretty much developed by the military, actually, uh, for, for pilots and stuff. Uh, 1926, safety studs car back then, had embedded wires in the glass, all the windows, all the way around. Right. Now, you see a, a Stutz from 1926, you probably won't find it, because I always look for that. Yeah. Like the Hershey, you might have yeah. a couple of them. Uh, 1928, two years later, that Pittsburgh plate glass introduced its version of safety glass called dew plate. Well, 1966, safety glass in all passenger cars were in the United States. It was now regulation standard all vehicle safety yeah all vehicles as a safety feature have the standard and we think of today's airbags which are also safe sure. okay yeah now let's get back to william a Utz. mr Utz. okay and i have here written right in my notes i'm going out on a limb and stating that these patents are all from the same man because the locations are different in towns and states. So he must have moved around. I don't know if he's trying mm. to stay a step ahead, ahead of, of the law. law. I don't know. Yeah, we <laughs> could say that, you know. It sounds one exciting, of, doesn't it? One of his it? airplane parachutes <laughs> failed. Yeah, I don't know. That's I don't right. Know. I, I couldn't find really anything about this man. Huh. Just very little, you know, oh. and this and that. But I did find his patents online. And the first one I'm going to talk about is called the windshield protector. 
It was patented in 1916, okay? You, you're seeing a picture of it uh, on your screen there. And that is a, a picture from the, the patent itself. And I don't know if you've ever read, you've read patents, right? Or at least yeah. looked at them, looked at them, okay? Yeah, I Because you the can't always pictures, get all the way through. The pictures are kind of confusing too. Yes. There's a lot of stuff. This one's rather simple. We're gonna get, we're gonna get some really involved ones okay. in a moment or two. All right. I'm okay, I'm ready. Um, the patent was for, for uh, automobiles or streetcars and is protect from broken glass or to prevent passengers from flying into the glass, okay? Um, how it works. You can see the bumper on it to the, um, to the left side of your screen there. Um, if you pushed on the bumper, okay, it would release a little lever inside the car. Now, I'm, I'd pick this car out of all the ones because this has glass all the way around. It's like a greenhouse yeah. with a it roof. It is. It's okay? like a fishbowl here. But it doesn't really have a bumper. So no. we have to pretend there's a bumper here. And if you, you hit it with any force, it would force the bumper in. And there's a lever. And it kind of went up around through. And at the base of the windshield was a roll of fabric. And it was spring-loaded. So when this guy hit, <laughs> there was a little hook there. And it released that fabric. And it would roll the, it would roll up in front of you, okay? Can you imagine <laughs> that? Okay, 1916. I'm having like deja vu. You went through this. No, huh? this is reminding me of the airbags. Oh. Okay. Remember, remember the airbags we talked about, where yeah. there was a thing at the bumper, and if it got pushed in, or there was a button you could press. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's just that, and that funny was like me. from the 60s, or yeah. 50s, 50s. Yeah, this is oh, okay. much earlier. Yeah, this is much earlier. All right. Okay. Uh, flexible material could be metal or fabric or leather. And if you go to the next picture there, you're going to see uh, another version. There's, there's uh, two versions here. And you can see where the windshield is on that car. <laughs> there's like a dotted line. So they had another type. This is all the same pattern, by the way. There was a version of that patent where you had a shield on the top, and if you hit that whole shield, would pop up in front of you. Okay. Now to get back to the fabric part, though, in in the first picture, um, there was a little screen patch in front of the driver. So if you were still moving, you could look through that. And then the glass could come right through at your eyes. Well, no, it was it was like cornea. a heavy heavy uh -huh. screen. <laughs> You and your cornea, so, <laughs> so that, that was that was pretty interesting. Wow. Okay. Now, not uh -huh. one to rest on his laurels. <laughs> I put that in there. I'm not even sure what that means. What the, what's it mean, resting on laurels? Anyway, we. Why would you rest on them? I don't know. Did you pick them you, and put them in a vase. That's something yours? for you okay. to come up All next right. show. Okay. William A. Lut William A. Utz. <laughs> next one here. Um, he had something called a automobile stoppage and occupant protecting equipment. Okay, this is two years later, 1918, okay? And if you look at that picture, now we have a... The first patent was just... Bar that you're looking at, there's uh, some mechanism there. And that's there's a bar, sliding bar, and there's hooks wow. and so on and so forth.
inside a car as a protection against glass or the like. We oh. talked about the fe oh. safety fenders. Remember yeah. those safety yes. fenders that came up? Uh -huh. And um, there was one of them would also do that, and I thought that was interesting. That's a scary. Okay. Um, other show. Okay. 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 <laughs> anyway, um, so that happens if if you know, you bump in, the brakes will be applied, the ignition will die, and these curtains will go flying up in front of you. Okay, now we talked about frontal impacts here. Both of these patents also had something where you come in from the side here, there was a little mechanism here, so if something ran into you from the side, all the same stuff would happen. Oh, wow. And there was patent that shows the windshield there and you can see the little Ooh, patch yeah. that would be in front of the driver yeah. and, Your little uh, and eye we, can, hole there. we can flash to the next picture and that's it's the same one but the top and stuff that's what you have to uh, it, it gets pretty complicated yeah. And that's the easy part. It's the text that's uh, yeah. really. It seems it's like double back on itself. Yeah. Wordy is it's the good. Very good wordy. Thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think I covered everything from the patent number two. Okay. Everything could be operated from a lever inside, too. All right. Yeah. I could just see, you know, dad's driving a car <laughs> the and his kid. kids next. <laughs> Watch this, and he reaches over. Yeah. My kid would do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kid walks from now on. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Back to William A. Utz. Utz. Not one to rest on his laurels. He had <laughs> another interesting patent, and um, he showed this picture. You're going to look at this. This was from 1918. Also, it was called Display Novelty for Moving Vehicles. Okay. Again, this isn't the right car, but. Uh, the cars that had radiators on uh -huh. them. You had the radiator cap, you know, had motor meters uh -huh. and different things. Okay, this was an eagle with a shield in front of it, okay? That eagle was lit. There's little light bulbs in there that lit the eagle up so you could be driving at night and you see the eagle. <laughs> oh, we're not done yet. <laughs> yeah. The mechanism, it would flap its wings. Yes. Oh my gosh, I was, yes. I was kidding. Okay. Yeah, there, there's a little mechanism in there and it would flap the wings wow. of an eagle. That's amazing. And you could be patriotic and, and with the illuminated. If they flap hard enough, will the car take off? No. Oh, no. Man. You do that, you need the airplane parachute. That's so, right. So that was interesting. You know, I, tr I tried to just stay with the, with the window stuff, which was interesting, and I saw that. I said, nah, we got to. Got to talk about this. All this right, now if someone neat. has one of those, that would look great in our hood it ornament would. case, wouldn't it? It would. <gasps> no, it would even look better on one of the cars. Yeah, <laughs> I could just see well, it on that. Daniel. <laughs> yeah, and we do have nice hood ornaments, but um, that would even be better. So. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. The William A. Utz collection. He's. I like it. This yeah. Utz guy. Mm -hmm. He's good. <laughs> yeah. So. That's pretty much uh, what we're going to talk about today. I love it. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, well, we talked about safety glass. We're going to go back a little even more. Mm -hmm. So we have someone here to talk about our bicycles. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So let's go take a look at the bicycles because I I hope people don't overlook them at the museum. They're really interesting. and we're Because gonna this is a museum of historic vehicles. Exactly. We're not just cars. Right. We do a or lot of stuff. Or, yeah. Yeah. So let's go learn about the bicycles. What do you say? Let's go. All right.
Okay, so usually we talk about motorized things or accessories for motorized things or what have you. Well, today we're going to look at our bicycles a little bit. <clears throat> you know, we do include bicycles as part of the museum collection here. So to talk to us a little bit about that, <clears throat> we have Autumn Shaner, and she's uh, the curatorial assistant here, and she has a I was going to say love-hate with the bicycles, but you don't hate them at all. You love the bicycles. So she's done a lot of research on these, and she's talked about them to different groups outside of here. So we asked Autumn to join us today and talk a little bit about what we have here. So hi, Autumn. Hi. <laughs> hi, Kendra. Hi, Dan. Hi. Thanks for nice, having me. Yeah, nice wave. I, I saw that little wave. Yeah. yeah it's my cool. signature move. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> We're starting here with the high wheelers. Um, so why, did, why are we starting with the high wheelers, I guess, instead of like regular bikes? To me, I think it's good to start with the high wheeler because it shows the progression of the bicycle, basically. What's important to remember is before the high wheeler, um, we used something called the Velocipede or the Bone Shaker. And what that was was a very primitive form of a bicycle that was made out of wrought iron and had wooden wheels. So that sounds like one, very, very heavy if it's that's the material. Absolutely. And two, I can see where the bone shaker yeah. term comes Oh, absolutely. From. And that's where it did come from because riding on yeah. that wrought iron frame yeah. and then having the wooden wheels, it was extremely uncomfortable mm -hmm. and very difficult to ride. Yeah. So what happened is uh, over time people realized that it's just uncomfortable, it doesn't make sense, um, they're cumbersome and heavy. So in 1870, James Starley, a man named James Starley, invented the high wheeler also called the penny farthing, the ordinary, um, or just the high wheel. These were manufactured specifically for men, and that'll come into play later um, when I talk to you guys about women and mm -hmm. um, bicycles. So what's important to remember about this is it has that big, big wheel in the front. The reason he did that is because you can go farther, faster, with a bigger wheel, and this is going to be a smoother ride than the bone shaker um, because of the large wheel and because it has a solid rubber tire instead of, of course, those wooden tires. So you're going to go farther in a faster period of time um, with the high wheeler, but they're super, super unsafe. <laughs> well, I can see for starters, you're saying, you know, they'll go faster, and I see one revolution of the pedals is one revolution of the, the wheel. Yes. And you, it's yeah. really going to travel. Serious fast. Yeah. And with that, you're talking about how fast they were. These were raced. And that was a really big deal um, in the 1880s was high wheeler racing. Uh, there were a lot of cycle domes, they called them, around our area especially. And they're like roller skating rinks. So I know Kendra and I grew up like going to roller skating rinks. Um, I'm sure Dan, you know, maybe he's not too no. old. We don't know. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. No, ro me and roller skates, see, there, there's like, I don't have wheels on my feet. <laughs> you don't have wheels, yeah. yeah and in, no. in this time, people were doing that. And what the purpose of them was, was for racing, you needed to practice. Mm -hmm. So they'd go to these cycle domes and they would practice there and they'd just spin around like we did at the roller skating rink and you'd practice there. Wow. You needed to practice because again, they were super unsafe, very unsafe to drive. You'd mount down here, which is, to me, the most unsafe part of the whole thing. That's where you'd have to step up and okay. just keep your fingers <laughs> crossed. Balance. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, and speaking of balance, as Kendra mentioned, it was really hard to stay balanced on these. Uh, and you could do something called taking a header, which means exactly like what it sounds like. You would be riding along, and because your center of gravity was off, you were you could fly across the front of the bike. So you'd be riding along. Oh, it's terrible. And you would literally land on your head. I've seen photos. It's traumatizing, to say the least. So you'd fly off the front, and you'd land on your head. So to avoid doing that, these people would practice. And that's what the point of the cycle domes were, just to practice riding, because it was really mm -hmm. hard. So now I feel like when you see these today, and we actually, we do have like a replica one of these and we let people try it out. Um, it's bolted to the floor, don't worry. But, <laughs> and it's like even shorter than these, like the wheel's not as big. But when I think of them today, it's almost like a, like a parade thing or like a, something unique and special. Like, but you're yes. saying like this was like normal average Joes would ride these things. Absolutely, was, it absolutely. It wasn't like a parade piece like it now, used to did, be. They, had, they had different sizes or pretty much all big for like adult men? 
Yes. Is that pretty much it? Yeah, you have you you hit the nail on the mm -hmm. head. Adult men, mm -hmm. um, only adult men riding these. They did have different sizes, but they it was like a few inches here and there. Okay. It pretty much was the same size, generally speaking. Actually, we have two. We have a Pope here in Overman, and then this. Um, I don't know if we know the maker of that one. I'm, I don't think we do, but you can see the difference here. Yep. This is actually a little smaller. Yep, I can than see that two. here. Yeah. So it's not a huge difference, but it's there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, how do you stop it? So, um, they have handbrakes, um, but a lot of people from what I read and did research on, uh, and this, was, this is very another unsafe, very scary part of the riding, is before um, the handbrake was on, some of them were manufactured and some of the, the people, ri the riders, chose to not have brakes on. So what they would do is they'd be, you know, okay, so you're riding along here and you think, okay, I need to stop up there. What you do is you basically try to slow down and then you would just ditch the bike. You would just go <laughs> bloop and fall off the bike. Did just you go. have to make that sound when you did that? <laughs> to me, it makes it more fun. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm sure in 1880 people weren't, you know, as uh, yeah. <laughs> animated? animated as I am. So <laughs> perhaps not. But you would literally dump off the bike. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. so, so these were like really... Uh, unsafe as you mentioned here and I don't know but that's all they had so they were sort of used to it right I mean it was, we want to ride a bike that's it it was so much better than the bone shaker that we mm -hmm. talked about earlier that yeah. people ignored the safety hazards of these because it was a smoother just just a smoother ride all around and just mm -hmm. a better ride all around um, so it was a huge improvement and people did not mind the, the safety hazard of it because they just loved that they weren't riding on this bone shaker. That mm -hmm. was terribly uncomfortable for them. So now we don't have them. I mean, you, you go to the store today and they have rows of bicycles for sale and you don't see any of these. No. So there was a transition somewhere? Yes. Yeah, so uh, 18, like I said, 1870, they started being manufactured and they lasted until about 1893. Mm -hmm. um, during that time, it's actually interesting, James Starley, who uh, built the first high wheeler, his nephew is John, I think his name's John Starley, he invented what we know today as the safety bicycle, okay. which is what replaced this. Mm -hmm. So ironically, his nephew kind of put him out of business, so to speak. Oh, and the safety nice. bicycle, isn't it? It's family stuff, you know, that hasn't changed. I, I was thinking Thanksgiving dinner what might have been interesting. Very much so. Yeah. <laughs> Riding in on one of these, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he, he around 1893. Mm -hmm. Now, I know these were popular, like, in Europe. Yes. But, and the ones we have here are not locally built, unfortunately. But were they locally? Like, did they make these in Pennsylvania? Yes, there were some companies. Okay. Most of the companies were up in what I would consider like the Northeast more, like Massachusetts, yeah. Maine, Vermont. Yeah. They're just more progressive, frankly, and they were starting things a lot earlier than we were maybe down here. But yes, we did in, in, in the state, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, and you're talking about the racing with them too. So you have the cyclodomes to practice. Is that where the races are, or do they have the races They elsewhere? had them at tracks. On dirt yeah. tracks, okay, which is actually really neat, and I think um, I think we're going to show some images um, too of the racing. You can see it, it's all on dirt track. Usually, they had someone kind of how I'm standing next to it now. You'd have the rider up on the bike, and then someone would stand next to him and like put him on, and then kind of get him going. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, I can see that. You, it would be needed. Your pit crew. Mm -hmm. Yes, the yeah, pit crew. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, okay. We had tracks locally, though, or did we not? We the the most that I could find were Reading and Philadelphia. Okay. Um, tons in Philadelphia. They, they were the tracks, or were they the the practice domes, or? Where? Well, there okay. were more okay. tracks, I would say, up towards our way, where there were more cycle domes and practice domes down in Philadelphia. As a matter of fact, there were quite a few down in Philadelphia okay. during the 1880s and 70s. Hmm. So the tracks were probably bigger and had to be out in the country. More. Yes, exactly, Got exactly. It. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it made sense that they'd be up here mm -hmm. rather than in the city. Mm -hmm. And you had photos too, I think. We have some photos of like some of the clubs. Yes. And they were riding these, yes. correct? Yeah. So it's like a social club too. Definitely. And that was something, uh, that was another benefit of this is it became like a craze. And the bone shaker, it didn't really take off, but when these came about, it really was a craze, it was popular, and it brought people together socially. 
And yes, many clubs sprung up, uh, tons in Pennsylvania um, and all over the country, mostly on this half of the country, but um, certainly they were very, very popular. Um, and then later on, as we'll talk about too, women's bicycling clubs started um, popping up as well. Hmm. And I could see, um, you know, this was before motorized um, personal vehicles, so this was their personal vehicle to maybe go to a different town. Absolutely. And, and that's probably the clubs, you know, they say, oh, we're going to have a club outing to such and such a town. Absolutely. Okay. And they would ride there. I mean, you know, yeah. it would be a group mm -hmm. thing. And, you know, for instance, my fiance, he's in a bicycle club and there's maybe 10 guys. Mm -hmm. You look at these photos of these clubs and there's 20, 30, 40, yeah. 50 plus people in these clubs. Mm. It is a whole thing um, with a lot of people and they're really dedicated to it. Okay. And I also read somewhere, and I've heard that these clubs kind of had clout as far as maybe with the roads and that sort of stuff. Yes. Yeah, so when actually I read in, down in Philadelphia mm -hmm. um, around Fairmont Park, they have, um, and I think we have a neat photo of that. I hope, I hope we can show that. Um, Fairmount Park, there's a photo of probably a hundred of them lined up in front of um, like Memorial Hall in Philly. They're right. about to go for a ride out in Fairmont Park. You can click or you can find online their map of their trail mm -hmm. and it's really interesting. When I started research on that, I found out that when they started building roads down there and such, they actually got in touch with some of the heads of these organizations to make sure they didn't interfere with their trails. Wow. So. Uh, that was wow. Yeah, that is some clout. Yeah. And, in, and, and it's neat because in the cities now, it's becoming trendy again to ride mm -hmm. and to have these bicycle trails around. So it's kind of neat how it all came back mm -hmm. around it in that way. You, you know, that's, it's very interesting because a lot of the stuff I talk about in this show is, you know, this, this, these items that people think, oh, this is kind of this new thing. And I'm pointing out, well, no, 100 years ago they did such and such. Absolutely. Again, with the bicycles, kind of the same yes, thing. Yes, absolutely. So, it's it goes in cycles. Yeah. It does. I mean, like the electric cars. In cycles. Cycle! I get it. <laughs> I meant to do that. I love that. Oh, yeah, you absolutely. did? Oh, no, okay. I didn't. <laughs> okay. No. So, all right. But yeah, like you mentioned about, you know, um, things, you know, we talked about. Like had toys in it and like, yes. yes, do you remember like that? Like a Christmas. It was the yes. Christmas shop. It was the Christmas well, shop. Well, no, it was like a Christmas, like a like living a room. Yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah. It was. A living room, yeah. yeah. And, and I was... remember cleaning that out. Yeah. Really? <laughs> you were the one. Yeah. Okay. No, there was some neat stuff in there. There so. was, and now we've turned it into like a bicycle shop from mm -hmm. I don't know what era is this? Like the I would say like the eight, eight, late 1800s, 1890s or so. Okay. And I say that because this bicycle in the window, which is our feature piece in the bicycle shop, is an 1898 women's bike. It's made by Acme. Um, they were a company in Reading, PA. So again, we're staying local. And what is so neat about this bike and what I think makes it very unique is how different it is from a men's bike, which I can talk about. Um, we mentioned the high wheelers and that being a strictly a men's sport. In 1893, when the high wheelers stopped being produced, that's when women really became um, able to ride bicycles and go out in the social atmosphere, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and the bicycle really allowed them to do that. Uh, okay. It was a big deal in the women's movement. As a matter of fact, Susan B. Anthony um, quoted it as the one thing that helped, the one main thing that helped the women's movement pro progress okay. forward. So, so it wasn't just an exercise thing. It was no. a lot more than that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It was about getting out there socially, politically, mm -hmm. having your voice heard. Plus, a horse was more expensive um, to take care of than a bike. Mm -hmm. So a lot of women were riding horses, but now they could ride a bike. Yeah, cleaner. Too. I'd rather ride a bike. That's just yeah. me. But, you know. Yeah. Well, even like, no. 1890s is a little early, but like the 1900s, 1910s, who had a car? Yes. You know, right. only the very wealthy. So it was like for middle or lower class women could now afford something like a bicycle. Absolutely. And, and use it and get around. Absolutely. More than they could before. And of course, <laughs> there were always, um, you know, those conservative men in the background at this time that 
thought that it would, um, you know, hurt us in emotionally, physically, in all these ways to mm -hmm. ride the bicycle. And what they did was, in order to kind of prevent us from riding, is they did it, made a couple things um, that were meant to be unappealing, but it didn't, it didn't distract us at all. We, we were still very excited to get out there and ride the bike. One of them is this seat. And they, they called them saddles back then. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, that seat there is called a hygienic seat. And the reason that it is called a hygienic seat, um, it has a large cutout in the center. And that is because men at the time, um, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of pseudoscience going around that women riding a bike, it would put a lot of pressure on our organs and all of our feminine parts, so to speak. And it would, we wouldn't be able to have children. It would just give us diseases and illnesses and all these things. So they made the seat um, in such a way that it would alleviate pressure and uh, we wouldn't be damaged. Our sensitive frames wouldn't be damaged by mm. the bicycle, which I think is just very interesting because, of course, we know that's not true. And you say this was, what term would you, like pseudoscience? Is that what you said? Yes, yeah, so yeah. you can see many ads, and actually on our signage here in the, in the shop, we have an ad uh, for a saddle, and they have x-rays put up. And the x-rays are of this woman, and all her yeah. insides are literally mm -hmm. all not where they're supposed yeah. to be. And it's from riding the bike for five minutes. Can you imagine? Okay. So that's pseudoscience. You know, it's fake mm -hmm. science. It's, mm -hmm. it's flat out not true. And it was just to deter us. So this seat here was made to counteract these claims, right? Yeah. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and again, and I see this a lot with the cars, is like, you know, the popularity of the early motorized vehicle thing. People are coming up with all these ideas, and some of them were, you know, kind of odd. And stuff. Oh, absolutely! And, and it's it, it's yeah. pretty neat how it all some of them are really cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, this is mm -hmm. still like the Victorian period, and like you and I have looked at other like Victorian era ads, and they're all a lot of them are very much like that. Like, drink this elixir, and you know, you will have mm -hmm. you'll live till like, your hair will grow back, and it's like yes, no, it won't. I mean, absolutely. it's very like snake oily, but. Um, that was like a thing to do back then. Certainly. So, so now the ladies riding this, yep. I can picture a lady in her big skirt, I guess they'd be <laughs> wearing a big skirt. Yeah. It would be kind of uncomfortable in this, am Absolutely. I right? Absolutely, yes. And it would catch into things. So we see The guard. Things, yeah, the guard. That wooden guard right there around that back wheel, that is to keep our skirt from not getting caught in the spokes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that was very important. And as Dan said, in the beginning, we were still riding our dress, uh, we were still wearing our dresses. As the years went on, then we um, started wearing bloomers and pants, which took place during something called the rational dress movement, which was basically a lot of women saying, we want to be comfortable. Yeah. We don't want to wear a corset that mm -hmm. destroys our insides. Mm -hmm. Not the bike. The bike isn't right. destroying our insides. <laughs> yeah. The tight fitting corset Corsets that are. we're wearing 10 hours mm -hmm. a day might be doing that. Um, so yes, the guard is on here. That's the wooden guard for the dress. Mm -hmm. You also have high handlebars here. And the reason for the higher handlebars is to keep our feminine posture because we need to sit, sit up straight. Mm -hmm. So all kinds of things like that were put into place to make it easier for us to ride mm -hmm. when we were still wearing our dresses and had to be super feminine. Okay. Which went it's, away it's over time. Yeah. So it, it's just neat, um, you know, a lot of this stuff. And, it is. Yeah. You know, and as it, this is our women's bike, but we also have other bicycles in here. Um, uh, some of them were manufactured in Pennsylvania. Some of them were not. But I would encourage people to come in and look at the differences between the women's bike and the men's bike because you really will see quite a few, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and yeah. even the, um, the frame has that you know, swoop. That's for the skirts, too, at first, yes. right? Because you know, if they're on the men's bike where the cross member goes straight across, what do you do with your... Yes, Curtain's where does it like, go? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. It, it, it would, it, what Kendra's saying is it would usually go straight across here, but it's dipped down. And what's interesting about that is bikes of today, like my bike at home that I have, it's still like that. Yeah. They've kept that design. Um, and when I asked the guy at the store, and of course he didn't know that I know what I was talking about, mm -hmm. he said, well, it's just easier to step into. And I thought, well... Is okay. okay. I mean, it, you're right. It is easier but to step is. in. He but wasn't but, wrong. Know, right. So. But, um, yeah, it's just so many differences that make it so neat and just how much it did for, for women 
is mm -hmm. really just astonishing to me. It's really impressive. Yeah. Now, and you said this was an Acme, and we have Acme somewhere else in the museum. Right. And Automobile. That is a car. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, and I see in the back there is a Reading Standard bicycle, and we got a Reading Standard motorcycle here. So, yeah. A lot of them started out in bicycle manufacturing. Yeah. It was just the game <coughs> to go into vehicle manufacturing oh, after yeah. a bicycle. Yep. Yep. So. <laughs> well, Durier was into yeah. bicycles. Oh yeah. Yeah. True. Before he started mm -hmm. cars, he's got patents on all kinds of tires. And oh yeah. And at that time, you could do it. You could do. You know, you could do anything. You could try it out and see if it worked out. Unfortunately for Kendra and I, it did. Because <laughs> Kendra and I bike all over the place, you know. Yeah, really, we're avid bikers. <laughs> but we have a sign here at the museum, too, like she's saying with this um, ad on it. <coughs> but it also has, like, rules that, like, the women are supposed to follow, too, which you and oh, you I love up at. Yep. <laughs> and it's, like, ridiculous stuff, like, don't try to be like the men. and Don't hmm. chew gum. <laughs> yes. Don't chew gum in the riding. <laughs> Um, don't wear a men's cap. Wow. Don't go out after dark by yourself. All kinds of silly yeah, it's things. And funny. it's on the sign, like Kendra said, and I, it's really quite cool. You They're have to funny. read it when you they come are in. funny. I don't think anybody would want to go out after dark on a bicycle because it was dark. I know. That's Couldn't true. see where you were going. It was a lot darker than it is today mm -hmm. outside. Absolutely. Yeah, no street yeah. lights and whatnot. Yeah. And they wouldn't have been anyway, I'm sure, but yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and like you said, we have other bikes in the in the shop too, and those are um, this is the only women's bike, but we do have other men's bikes in here. Some of them by strange builders that we don't know too much about, but we're always looking for more um, information. Especially like I'm looking here, just standing here at the sign. Like I know there's a, a relay bike. We don't know really <laughs> much of anything about relay. Um, Very interesting. So you know, some of these Reading Reading had a lot of bicycle building. So if anyone that's watching knows anything. About oh, ready manufacturers, we would love to know more because the information is sometimes really difficult to find. Or if you have <laughs> a bicycle that would fit our museum, oh, there you go, yeah, physically it'd fit like yeah. right here, yeah, go anywhere. that'd be tiny. great, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> so. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Acme and Reading Standard are usually kind of easy because they had a history after the, the bike manufacturing more than some of these mm -hmm. others, but. We're always looking for stuff. And there's one in here too, I think, that is a racing bike, we think. Because yes. the wheels are so huge. So Yes. And that is the relay. Racing. Yeah, they were still racing these too. Yes. <coughs> and racing of the high wheelers continued into the twenties. Just because they stopped manufacturing mm -hmm. them, people were still racing them. People were still into them into the twenties and even the early thirties. Okay. Yeah. Neat. <coughs> what do we forget to ask about our bicycles? There's a lot more. Yeah. There's so much. There, there's so much that can be said. I mean, the information out there is just overwhelming, and it's really fascinating. I, I, I think, now I've done some reading on, on these old bikes and stuff, and it is interesting because not many people know about them today. No. You know, the old stuff. I mean, of course, there's people who do have the interest, for, but for the general person, you know, you tell them a lot of the stuff that you, you have said in the last... 20 minutes here is, you know, people don't know about. No, it's they don't. It's really interesting. And they, they don't. And, and I think it's, tr and what's good for us as the museum is it's trendy again. It's trendy. Mm -hmm. Bikes are trendy again. Um, high wheelers are actually trendy again. Obscure bikes like that. So it's all coming back around and it's bring, I think it's bringing more people in mm -hmm. to see these because they're starting to see modern versions of them out today mm -hmm. and just that people are biking more than driving in cars, yeah. really, especially in cities and things like that. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Something for everyone to learn about. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it's when I've given tours to like little kids in here, like Cub Scout troops and stuff, it's always fun to dwell on the bicycles because they can understand them. Yes. The cars, that's beyond most of them, but you know, every kid has a bicycle. Yeah, absolutely. And you can even explain a high wheeler to them and, and they kind of have an idea. Oh, definitely. And they love it. Yeah. And they yeah. love riding on the high wheeler that we have bolted to the floor. Yeah. Well, because it was so dangerous. Oh, yeah. So yeah. let's Your put our kid kids on. Danger, it. yeah. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for yeah. going over thank this you. with us. Oh, there's, yeah. there's, there is more to learn here. I know there's stuff we didn't talk about this on the sign. If you come and look at the shop, mm -hmm. you'll see there's like ads 
and uh, little things, you know, posted around. There's little nuggets in there. To and I think to. Autumn did such a great job. She could do another show and tell us even more. <laughs> We could right. do a whole thing okay, on fan Annie mail. Londonderry, who we didn't even get to yet. That's so, well, true. Yes, and she's really cool. We could take a whole half hour to talk about her. We so. could. Mm -hmm. we'll she rode around the world in a yeah. year. Okay. In the I, late 1800s. Yeah. So. Yeah. Good. Well, well yes, I'll come back. Bye. Did you hear that? Did you hear that world? <laughs> <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> but she, she is a neat story. And there are like little stories like that of people doing just crazy things. Mm -hmm. The firsts are always Definitely. interesting. And she's an interesting one. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll have to touch on her next time. Definitely. Okay. But Cool. So thanks for, yeah. thanks for Thank having you. me on. Yep. And yep. Uh, I guess <clears throat> we're going to go uh, back in the diner. Mm -hmm. And we'll see mm -hmm. where you've been lately. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yep. okay. Thank you. All right. We're back in the diner. We had a great little uh, talk about sit glass and some strange inventions. Then we learned about our bicycles. And now it's time for me to ask, where have you been lately? Where have I been? Yeah. I've been everywhere. You have. You Remember do. Hank Snow song? I've been everywhere. Where, babe, I've been everywhere. Anyway, <clears throat> I took a trip <laughs> um, <clears throat> Thanksgiving, I guess. Thanksgiving weekend, kind of a long weekend. I took an extra day to go down to my parents. Anyway. Um, I stayed at tourist cabins on Lincoln Highway. <gasps> yeah, which is like really cool. Yeah. Uh, man's Choice, other side of Bedford. If you're ever out that way, you got to go. It's neat. Little cabins out of 1940, I think. <laughs> um, cool. I also went to the Galitzin, Pennsylvania train tunnels, which is pretty neat. Except it was cold, it was snowy, and there was a lot of <laughs> snow on the ground. And you couldn't really walk around like you wanted to. Um, I also went to the Flight 93 <laughs> Memorial. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now right, I just said three things. Yeah. I could. I just said three things. I could have three more shows. Yeah. But while I'm you driving your bridges around, now. while I'm driving around, I saw three mail pouch barns. Uh huh. Okay. Uh huh. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. Mail pouch tobacco. Okay. You see right here. You got this fancy sign here. Okay. And um, this used to be painted on barns uh, all over the place. And I, I got liking them, uh, I don't know, about 30, 40 years ago. Where my parents lived, there were several of them close by, so I would take pictures yeah. of it. Well, it grew and grew, so I got pictures of hundreds of barns now, <laughs> okay? Anyway, the, the um, Mail Pouch Tobacco was started by a company called Block Brothers, B-L-O-C-H, um, tobacco company out of Wheeling, West Virginia. They had barns painted, or they painted barns between 1891 and 1992. Barn owners were paid one or two dollars per year. Whoa. Okay. But you think, that's not really that much, you know. They got a painted barn, though. That's true. Yeah. That's so, true. So there you go, you know, the labor and, and all that stuff. So it's, it's pretty interesting. But... Um, now they're in Wheeling, West Virginia, or were in Wheeling, West Virginia. So closer you got to Wheeling, the more barns you saw. There was some around here too. There's, yes. There's one, uh, one couple right miles down the road, really. Yeah. And um, so there was uh, another one over in Bechtelsville, and one in Leesport. And anyway, they were all over. Um, the majority of the barns that were painted were by a gentleman called Harley Warwick. Actually, before you look at him, let me, I'm going to show some pictures here as I'm talking. And you're going to see uh, a picture, and it has some great yard art there. There's an old coupe and old pickup <laughs> trucks parked in front. Actually, that's about five, six miles from here. Oh. Really neat. Now, I have pictures of it, and it's snow. I remember 17 degrees. I'm out taking pictures of this thing. To get the nice snowy yeah, and there's, scene. Yeah, and there, there was, um, I don't know, there was some sort of, cow type thing like a bull or something out in the field just <laughs> looking at me <laughs> thinking Maybe. you were nuts yeah well i wasn't <laughs> the one just standing in the field <laughs> so okay that's the first one there and the second one is uh out of a town called tyanesta pennsylvania i think i pronounced that right which is northeast pa out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> okay so 
And then the third one you're looking at is Beach Creek, Pennsylvania, which is sort of near Lock Haven, kind of a nice one. And then the next picture you're going to see, that's Harley Warwick. He's the one who painted most of these barns. Did it for 76 years. Oh, my gosh. No, I'm wrong. He lived 76 years. Whew. I'm sorry. Okay. Still. <laughs> anyway, he was involved in World War II. When he was done, he came home to the family farm, and um, he ended up being recruited to help paint his parents' barn with the mail pouch sign. So they convinced him to join them, and he decided that painting barns is better than milking cows. So that's how he started. <laughs> okay. He estimated that he painted 20,000 barns. Dear God. That's a lot of barns. That's a lot of barns. I can't even picture 20,000 barns. Wow. Average time, six hours. So you could do two barns <laughs> a day during the, during the summer, oh, I guess. God. Okay. Uh, most of the time, it was by himself. He didn't have helpers, but most These of the are time, big barns. Big barns. For like one guy to do. Yeah. Oh, my so, God. Um, you got the black or red background. You see more black <laughs> than red, but... You know, you see both of them. Um, when he retired in 1992, the company decided wow. they would not paint barns anymore. So that's, oh, that was it. Can't do it anymore. With um, him now, I went to see him. I, found, I actually found where he lives because I was in that area, and I saw a mailbox <coughs> that was painted up like a mailbox barn. And so I actually went to the people's, knocked on the door. Where'd you get that from? She said, oh, I got it as a gift. But... Harley Warwick, who painted, paints this stuff, lives nearby, and she gave me directions. I went to his house. Oh, my God. And, and I spent about an hour. He talks all these stories. Belmont, Ohio is his town. And um, <laughs> very interesting, very down-to-earth guy. And he ends up, that, at that time, um, since he was retired from painting barns, he painted stuff and sold them as souvenirs. Yeah. And so that's where this sign uh -huh. came from. Aha, okay. okay. And this is a, a Harley Warwick original. Yeah, and he, it's signed down here, 1993, okay? Wow. And, and he also makes these, as he called this, a city mailbox instead of a <laughs> rural mailbox, okay? And, um, and that's pretty neat. And he also sells bird feeders that look like barns. Now, I bought one of them, too. Oh, my god! But it was used as a bird feeder, and so it, uh, birds are not clean. They're not the they're cleanest kind of, of God's so, creatures, yeah. no. no <laughs> now, you saw a picture of him standing next to his own rural mailbox, which was pretty spectacular. I remember wow. I, I saw that, and I said, hey, you know, can I have your picture next to it? And he had the pose like he's done it a million times already. So, wow. Really interesting That's stuff. And it was, cool. it was so interesting talking to him about <coughs> it because he was telling me about this and that. Like, you know, he always started with the, the letter E and the word chew. That was his beginning. And then he went out from there and he painted it. Really? He showed me this paintbrush he had that was huge. He says, you could put that in. It was like a half a gallon of paint was on that. But you could do it, you know. So... So anyway, um, that's what he he was doing, and um, wow! In 1965, okay, there was the Highway Beautification Act, okay, that banned advertising within a certain um, distance of a highway. Okay. Um, it was brought up by a lady called Claudia Johnson. Ever hear of <gasps> Claudia Johnson? No, I don't know her. Ah, uh, yes, you do, because her do. Wait. her name, she was called Lady Bird Johnson. So it was President Johnson's ah! wife. She had this beautification act. However, mail pouch signs were considered a national historic landmark. Oh, so, left them so I was going to say, because I know of some that are pretty close to yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. But they were safe. So thanks to Claudia oh, Johnson. That's so cool. So, uh, within 660 feet of an interstate highway. Wow. So, so that was, that's it. That's so. neat. Now, you're going to see some more pictures. And let's see, okay, I have a little bit of time. You're going to see more pictures. Uh, there's one of uh, a barn in Harrisonville, Pennsylvania. That's near McConnellsburg. Okay. Yeah. Um, another one near Cash Town which is um, other side of Gettysburg, another one um, 
in Centerville, Pennsylvania. Okay, and that's like near Bedford. And, and then the last one is uh, out in the middle of the state, just north of uh, the interstate there. Now, last thing I'm going to talk about, there is an actual club out there called Mail Pouch Barnstormers. You go on their website. Is there really? It's great. <laughs> they have, they have a, a national picnic get-together every year in really? Belmont, Ohio, and they meet in the, in the school gym. And you look at the pictures, <laughs> and I think I might join it just That's to go. That's awesome. Because it's this little old wooden gym out in this little you country should. town. So. <gasps> okay. So That is a cool story. Yeah. I like hearing about Harley. Good old Harley. Neat guy. What a, yeah. I bet he was a really neat guy. Yep. Cool. Okay. I like it. Yep. Good job. And they're all over, so keep your eyes open for them. Now you know yep. a little bit more about how There's they got There's a lot that less way. now than there used to be because yeah. they're they don't paint them anymore. Right, so. right. Very cool. Okay. All right, we covered a lot of territory tonight, so um, <clears throat> we will uh, take our leave of you now, and we're gonna go start planning next month already. Yes. Yeah, because that's what we do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so everybody, we will see you next month right here on PCTV. Thanks for joining us.